Welcome to the Inside Pitch. I'm Christopher Lockhart, the creator and administrator of this Facebook group where screenwriters, filmmakers, creatives meet to ask and answer questions and exchange ideas and information on the craft and business of movie making. I am joined today by my co-administrator, Ramesh Santanam. Hey, Ramesh. Hi. Um, I want to welcome those who are tuning in live. We appreciate, as always, your participation. And Ramesh and I want to make a shout out to Steve Enlow, our uh, uh, third administrator in our group. We also want to send out birthday wishes. Today. Exactly. Happy, R Ramesh, do you want to sing happy birthday? <laughs> We could both sing. <laughs> Maybe not. A happy birthday to Phil. Phil, uh, Phil is a, a, a young man, uh, very uh, active in our group, and uh, we, of course, appreciate uh, his support. He's a so, mensch. He is a mensch, isn't he? Yes. Yes. So, uh, happy birthday. Um, so, Ramesh, do you want to make the introduction because we are very excited today uh, to have uh, our guest and uh, you know man this guy's got some he's got some credits exactly he's uh, got he's got some credits uh, Jeb Stewart is renowned for writing what is uh, often referred to as the greatest action film of all time Die Hard he also wrote uh, The Fugitive which was nominated for several Academy Awards and won Tommy Lee Jones one uh, and he also directed Switchback, uh, a thriller starring Dennis Quaid and Danny Glover, among others. And right now he is writer-creator of The Liberator and Vikings Valhalla, both for Netflix. Jeb, welcome to the Inside Pitch. yippee ki hey yay yeah. motherfucker! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, look, having, uh, having Die Hard on your resume, it's... Uh, uh, as Entertainment Weekly has called it the greatest action movie of all time, it's certainly difficult to dispute. Um, so that was your first credit. So how does a new writer get that job? It wasn't a spec script. I'm assuming it was an assignment. So can you maybe just give us a little bit of the backstory of how did you get there? Yeah, I, I, I came out of uh, graduate school. And I'd been in graduate school for quite a while. I, I did a master's at Chapel Hill, and then I did a master's uh, at Stanford University. Uh, and did the, uh, that's when the Nickel Fellowship was, uh, was out, of, out of Stanford. And I spent a year up there uh, uh, working on my Nickel script. And uh, based on that script, which was the one you referred to, Switchback, which I... I had a chance to make about 12 years later, but uh, based on that script, I got signed uh, by uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg and when they were reorganizing Disney back in the mid 80s. And so I came down and uh, had an office and everything was great. I was suddenly, you know, a Hollywood screenwriter. And um, I, I found out right away that uh, studios uh, never make anything from people they they own <laughs> they, it's always the guy on the other side of the fence so after about a year at disney um uh during the reading period on a script that was not going anywhere um i uh, was offered uh, uh, a book uh from fox from larry gordon's company of fox uh and it was called nothing lasts forever obviously and and uh, uh uh, you know, they, it, it was just a, uh, it was a, it was an interesting book because it was told pretty much an interior monologue and, um, uh, and it was very difficult to have about a 65 year old man who comes to LA and he ends up dropping his daughter off the top of a building on Wilshire Boulevard. And, uh, uh, but, uh, like any smart screenwriter, I said yes right away. And it was like, I'll figure it out later. Um, so it was an assignment and it was, um, the, the great thing about working with, uh, with, with Larry at that time was that uh, uh, he left me alone. Uh, I got to go out and uh, figure out what it was going to be like. I had to, you know, come up with a, a how do I get it into a space where I thought that there was a better movie. And, uh, and I didn't have a whole lot. I, in fact, 
there was absolutely, I was so far off the radar at Fox that I think I could have probably written anything and, uh, and they would have been surprised. So anyway, that's how I got the assignment. So let's go back. You won the Nickel Fellowship. I did. And was this back when it was only for college students? Because in the earliest days, it was only open to college students. Yes. And in the earliest stage, it was only at Stanford University. Um, oh, okay. And it was only at Stanford, and it was administered by Julian Blaustein, a terrific producer who was my professor there. And uh, Julian worked in the days of, uh, I mean, he did, uh, he produced The Day the Earth Stood Still and Broken Arrow and Bell Book and Candle. And a terrific, it was great to, to learn screenwriting from a producer uh, and a producer who really loved writers. And so um, uh, that was a great experience for me. And, and, and it, was a, it was a formative time too, because Julian bridged that period of time in Hollywood where uh, I had the, you know, I had the good fortune to have lunch with, you know, several of Hitchcock's writers who were still alive and people like Julie Epstein, you know, who wrote Casablanca and stuff like that. So it was a, it was a great time for me. And so I had to, uh, I had to compete against my very small screenwriting master's class, which they were all really, really good writers. But, um, uh, I'm going to tell you something. I would hate to be in that pool today. It's a really, uh, it's a really terrific award, and I'm very proud to be associated with it, even in any way possible. So, is it safe to say that you would be the Nichols' uh, first success story? Is that uh, is that possible? It, it, if 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 there was somebody before me, I don't know it, so I guess it's safe to say that <laughs> I don't I don't know. But uh, you know, the, certainly one of the earliest success stories. Yes, that, that's, that's probably true. So, so you would definitely say that the nickel was your introduction into the business? It, it was. And it, the, the great thing about it was it did, it, even back then, it definitely opened up a door, you know, but, but you had to have a script come out of it. Um, and, um, you know, when I'd been in graduate school for five years, I'd been supported by my wife. Uh, I had a you know, a three month old child who had been born preemie, I probably owed him, you know, a bazillion dollars. So when, um, when my script was, was when I got the, the job at Disney and I was very fortunate to get a terrific agent, you know, to, to, uh, write off of that nickel script. So, you know, it, it was, a, it was a huge boost for me. And I still tell my students and other students that, you know, and people get trying to get in, that the, the award is, uh, and there's several awards out there, but an award is a wonderful way to get some recognition and uh, stand out from the crowd. So you wrote Die Hard. Uh, how different was the uh, outcome, the actual film, compared to your first draft? Um, it's actually a lot closer to my first draft than you would believe. The biggest change that was made in the script was... Um, uh, blowing up the top of the building, and uh, and and I remember, um, I remember by that time Joel Silver had come on board, and I remember Joel saying, you know, we've got this, the top of the building is all wired up, and and uh, and so and he's up there, and you gotta, you know, it, it's gotta blow, and I said, well, there are all these people up there, Joel. And I said they're gonna die, and he said, no, they're not, <laughs> they're not gonna die. I didn't, I, I'll never forget. It. He said, I didn't stand, I, you know, I didn't take my girlfriend out to dinner and and stand in the rain in Westwood for an hour and a half around this theater to see all these people get blown up. He said, you go figure it out. So uh, I went, I, I thought that was made a lot of sense. And I went back and, uh, and, and figured out the, I remember when I was scouting that building because way before Die Hard was a twinkle in anybody's eye, um, I went, because I didn't grow up with high rise buildings and such. And I went over uh, Larry's building, Larry's office was the star's office, the star's building, um, at the, at the back of the, of uh, the Fox lot in those days near the commissary. And as I would be sitting in the conference room, I could look through the window at this building going up Fox Plaza. And so I remember leaving the lot and driving around the corner and parking there on the construction site and going in and introducing myself to the building manager, who was a sadistic guy from New York and he when he found out that I'd never ridden on the top of a high-speed elevator or been in an air shaft or any of those other type of terrifying things he he just rubbed his hands <laughs> and put me on the top of the elevator and closed the door and sent it up to the top and um, 
so anyway, it was there, a lot of that was there. But I remember being up on the top of the building for the very first time, and there was a um, uh, the, the fire hose, and saying, "God, this would be great." And he said, "No, no, 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 that, that, that don't touch that. That that's not that's not really secure. It's not supposed to hold somebody. It's supposed to just wheel off the fire hose." And I thought, well, in my devious mind, I thought that's perfect um, because I come from the school of thought where. You know, it's the old, uh, you know, the, the you know the, the the parachute story where you know the good news is you've got a first class ticket on a plane. The bad news is the plane's going to crash. The good news is the pilot comes out and says, "Look under your seat, everybody." You know, there's a parachute. The bad news is your parachute fails. The good news is there's a haystack down below. The bad news is there's a pitchfork in the haystack. So if you apply that to the fire hose. You know, the good news is there's a fire hose and there's an explosion at the top and you're trying to get off the building. The bad news is there's a window. Uh, I mean, you know, that, that you survive that, but the bad, you know, you have a window to get through, but you can't get through. And then you have a gun, you shoot it and you get finally get through. And next thing you know, you get pulled out. So um, anyway, it's uh, back to what survives an, an enormous amount of great stuff, you know, uh, from the very first script survived. And um and I learned a lot about that. I learned things, for example, where I I wanted uh, I wanted John McClane to rest a little bit. Uh, I remember in the very first draft, I I, I had him, uh, believe it or not, taking a nap, and uh, and th that didn't even survive a draft. I think I um, when I was reading it through, I thought, you know, did Clint Eastwood ever take a draft a nap in Dirty Harry? You know, no. so anyway, that went out the window right away. And as a result, it just becomes this sort of Nike missile that goes up and you just have to keep up with it. Yeah, I think one very good lesson from that movie is that uh, each, each solution creates another complication. Yeah. And, yeah, and it just, it, just, it just keeps rolling that way and it's, it's just so much fun. One of our members, I just have to read this because I love this, um, Steve Lamb. Uh, gave his interpretation of Die Hard. So this is my Annie Hall moment where I pull <laughs> out Marshall McLuhan. You're going to be Marshall okay. McLuhan, Jeb. Um, okay. Steve Lamb says, Die Hard is an allegory for the dysfunctional family gatherings during the holidays. We're all trying to mend something emotional, but at the same time, we feel trapped. Like John McClane without shoes, we're vulnerable at the start of the night. However, as we get into family arguments, we start to gain our weapons to fight back, just like McClane collecting his arsenal as the night goes on. <laughs> what do you think about that? Wow. wow. <laughs> I mean that that could be in the Paris Review. I, I um I uh, I it, you know the interesting thing about it is that um, uh, it is a holiday movie, and the family was a big part of it for me because the family was not the family wasn't in the novel at all. Uh, there was you know it was about a sixty five year old man coming to visit his daughter, but but in terms of uh, you know, some resonance for, for Jeb Stewart. I didn't, I didn't have that. And, and, um, you know, I've, I've told this story before, but it, it's, it, 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 it has a good lesson to it in that. Yes. I said yes to nothing lasts forever. I'm going to, I'm going to write this. It's going to be an action movie, that sort of thing. But I, and I, I didn't have any idea how to get into that story. And I was trying to really adapt the novel and, um, and, uh, you know, in my personal situation, I had a fight with my wife one night. My office was down at Disney. I was living in Pasadena. And instead of apologizing, I get in the car. and I take off to go back to my office, was nearly in an accident, pull over to the side of the road. And suddenly I realized that's that's diehard. It's not about a 65 year old man who comes to L.A. and drops his daughter off the top of a building. It's about a 30 year old guy who has a fight with his wife. And he should have said he's sorry because bad shit can happen after that. And so for me, you know, the, the movie just sort of takes off from that, from that particular part. So you just said it's a holiday movie. So are you, are you absolutely 100% <laughs> verifying that Die Hard is a Christmas movie? Um, I, I, am, I think that I have personally stoked this, Chris, because it ups my residuals every Christmas. I okay. completely agree. If I can keep agree. it in the news, it's great. But, Absolutely. Um, 
But I will share this, that from the very beginning, uh, when I started developing this, uh, Lloyd Levin, who was, you know, the head of development for Larry's company, had always thought that he wanted to have a movie where it snowed. And the idea of Christmas was always embedded in, it was even embedded in the novel. And one of the main reasons it was embedded in the novel was not that they wanted to do, you know, Roderick Thorpe wanted to tell a Christmas novel. It was, you need to get the people out of the building. Otherwise you got a whole skyscraper full of people. So Christmas Eve makes a very, you know, good plot point. You know, I don't have to do a lot of explaining to get the people out of the building. But from that point on, um, it, it could have just been a plot point. And, and for me, I needed to bring the family in. This is a guy coming back into putting his family back together. And what better time to do that than at a Christmas uh, period. So, um, and while I fought the snow thing all the way to the end, it, we, I, I do have all the paper coming down and the bearer bonds and stuff like that. So I think that, that it's, a, it's a nod to, to Lloyd's snowstorm in LA on Christmas Eve. Well, whether it's a Christmas movie or not, I watch it all year long. So, um, <laughs> you know, Christmas Carol, It's a Wonderful Life, once a year, sometime between Thanksgiving and New Year, but not Die Hard. So, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Steve Enlow has a question and he asks, did any particular scripts or movies serve as models for writing the action sequences in Die Hard. What, what was your inspiration? Any inspiration? No, um, and, and I, I don't want this to sound cavalier, but, um, and this is a, a, a something that, um, you know, again, I tell my students and, and others is that um, I had not written a, an action movie before. And I think that that's actually a really good place to come to from um, for writing, um, to writing action. Um, I felt that the, the humor that comes, that's embedded in Die Hard is, comes from kind of a, uh, almost an embarrassment that, they, that we have a guy who, you know, is put into these type of circumstances. In terms of writing the action, I felt that the, and I still feel very strongly about this today, it's in everything that I write, is that, is that the action should just be uh, uh, a reflection on who the character is. It better explain more about that particular character. And John McClane was not a, he wasn't a, a, a martial arts, you know, pro. He, he was just a cop. He didn't, he shouldn't move like, um, you know, like Bruce Lee. He should, you know, he should have, he should feel like, uh, uh, you know, just a, an everyman type of guy who's a detective in New York. Uh, excuse me. The, um, so everything is just informed by the action. And I think you, um, uh, it, it, it works so much better. It tells part of the story and, so I, I would have a very difficult time writing just, um, you know, action for action's sake. In fact, I, I probably wouldn't know where to begin with that. As a Hollywood screenwriter, you're accustomed to being rewritten. It's they're constantly bringing in writers on top of writers on top of writers. Uh, how do you handle that? How uh, has it changed now as opposed to in the beginning? Uh, are you offended by it or do you just accept the process? Is it all part of the learning curve? Um, it's well, since Chris, since I'm the guy that gets brought in now, uh, I, I have maybe a different approach on that than I did Excellent. You know, with Die Hard. But, um, you know, it's, it is a, it's a business. I understand that. I, um, I fight it tooth and nail. I don't think lots of times that, um, Sometimes, uh, I mean, I've been fired from projects before, you know, like right before production. And sometimes you get fired in those situations because the director needs an extra week of prep. And it's easier to get rid of the writer than, than it is to, you know, uh, fight with the studio some more. So there's all sorts of reasons about that. I, I, I've come in and replaced other writers many, many, many times. And I always try to give somebody a call and say, hey, you know, um, I'm, I'm following you in is, you know, I you know, just wanted to chat with you, talk about the project and things like that. And, and t nine times out of 10 people are like, you know, other writers are really, really good about that. They're, you know, they're, they're excited that the, 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 that a project has momentum because that's sort of the, the, the right side of the brain talking, which is, you know, I guess I want my project made. 
uh, and I want to I, I hopefully it gets made and we improve things. Um, boy, that's a that's a really tough thing to understand when you're starting out, um, especially when you feel like you're the right guy, you're the only guy, or worse than that, this is your baby. You have cut it from whole cloth. Um, but if uh, it is a collaborative industry, and um, and one of the great things that I've learned on my growth curve, uh, which which kind of looks like that, should look like that, but it's, well, it's a lot longer, uh, is that um, the, the movie that I write is mine and mine alone only once. And that's when it's on my computer. And the, even when I'm directing, you know, my shows, it's, it's, uh, uh, it never ends up how I originally um, envisioned it. So if you open that up to, uh, uh, it's going to be opened up again when, when a director comes on board, it's going to be opened up again when, you know, a, a new executive producer comes in with some kind of thought. And then it's really going to get opened up when, you know, the, the production designer and the costume comes in. And, and boy, when the actors come in, you can throw away your original vision completely. Um, that should be a good process. And what I try to do is I try to give everybody you know, the very best script that I can possibly give that, even if it's going to be rewritten by somebody else, I really feel like that's my contribution. It's got to be incredibly well thought out. If I'm building a, if I'm building a 80 story skyscraper and, and that's my job, uh, it better have bathrooms on floors 20 through 40. You know, uh, you can't make, you can't make a building without bathrooms on these floors. So the, part of my job is to do the very best I possibly can. And if I do that, then I'm only going to be bringing in better and better and better people and, and we'll make a better show. One of our members is asking, how did you feel about Bruce Willis being cast? And does he send you a Christmas gift every year with a card that says, <laughs> thank you? <laughs> I think we all should thank each other. I, the, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things about that movie, which was, which, um, which is very true with the exception of somebody like uh like joel or larry uh the, the 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 big pieces that came in starting with me and uh and then john mctiernan who had done predator uh and and then bruce who had had two movies that had not done particularly well though i i really loved blind date uh we were all surprised about bruce uh and you know it did the the script did go out to Clint Eastwood, which was interesting because I'd gone to great lengths to take it from a 60 year old man to a 30 year old, you know, uh, uh, protagonist. And then the first thing Fox does is go out to, to Clint. And um, uh, and then and then it went to Paul Newman, another, you know, person who was not written into the into the piece. It, it brought up something that became very apparent for all of us at the beginning is that Fox really didn't know what kind of movie they were making at that time. It was considered an adventure movie. And if you look at the adventure movies that had come out of the late seventies and seventies, like, you know, the uh, Poseidon adventure and towering Inferno, I kind of think that they thought Die Hard was another towering Inferno. And even in the early one sheets, it says 40 stories of adventure when, well, it's not adventure, but, but anyway, that's what, that's where we started with. But, uh, it, Bruce John, who was desperate to get out of you know the, the the predator area, and and me, who was desperate to get any kind of movie made at that point, uh, I think poured everything that they had into that. It was uh, it was under the radar. There was no expectations, um, and uh, and and that's a good thing to remember. You know when you're when you're starting out that it can come from anywhere. Let's switch gears for a moment uh, and let's talk about what you're doing at the moment because you're currently working on two Netflix original shows and uh, you're trying to get them up and running in the day of COVID. So can you sort of just give us a little bit of backstory on these shows and how you're managing current events? Well, fortunately, Liberator, which is a World War II drama um, for Netflix and uh, the studios A&E and and it's being done in a very cool type of hybrid am animation called Trioscope. And um, uh, that was actually filmed uh, last year in Poland and, and that's in post right now. So we're, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not fighting COVID on Liberator, which is great. But uh, Valhalla, which is uh, uh, a, 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 a the thread off of the great Viking tree that uh, MGM 
uh, and Michael Hurst created. Uh, we're over in Ireland. It's, um, it's a challenging situation for sure. Um, we're doing tons and tons of testing. Uh, we've got, uh, fortunately, we've got uh, a lot of our, we have a phenomenal back lot over here so that we can do a lot um, on the stage and in the back lot. And, the, and we own the locations, or um, own in the sense that we, we can go to our specific locations without having to worry about uh, interference or, or anybody coming into it or in, you know, getting inside of our bubble. But it is a, uh, it takes a tremendous um, effort by the network, by the studio, um, uh, in terms of saying, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Tremendous amount of communication with cast. Uh, you're inside this bubble. You can't go, you know, into you can't go into Dublin and drink yourself silly and come back and expect to be, you know, um, you know, uh, bulletproof. Uh, and I spend an awful lot of time talking to crew and cast and and you know trying to to keep this all you know all for one, one for all type of situation. I think that that's going to be the case across the industry when it starts. Um, if you don't have that dedication, you're not going to make a show. It's just impossible to do it. Lexi Stewart <laughs> says that her son Otis points out that uh, you worked on the movie Outbreak. And so it's perhaps uh, ironic that you're now working uh, during an actual viral pandemic. I know. Where, where was I? I should have written uh, Outbreak 2. Um, yeah, I did. I went down and uh, I, I went down to CDC and I'll tell you. I remember going down to that fourth level where they keep the Ebola and all the hemorrhagic viruses. And as we're coming up, I said, God, that's really scary. And the, and the doctors there were saying, oh, that's not scary at all. You know, um, you just don't want to get involved with the, you know, one of these flu viruses. And, you know, we're all, we're all dead if that happens. And that just resonated to, with me uh, for 20 years. It just was one of those kind of things where I was like, um, you know, how, how is that going to turn out? But if you go back and you read the 1918 pandemic, you know, about the flu and the influence of the pandemic of that, it's just like, boy, those guys knew exactly what would really cripple the world. Um, but uh, yes, I did work on Outbreak. So um, you've also had the opportunity to direct. And uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that transition going from writer to director. Was it easy? Uh, I, I think you said that, uh, and correct me if I misheard you, that Switchback was your Nickel Fellowship script, the script that you wrote during the year, or was it the script that won you the fellowship? Uh, it's the script that I wrote uh, on the fellowship. Okay. On the fellowship, right. And, um, uh, and, and it was a it was a an interesting script. It had uh, I I will never forget the script going out. My you know it went out to the town. It went to every studio. It was uh, it had the great good fortune um, of going out during the Night Stalker killing. Uh, and it was about a it, obviously Danny Glover plays a serial killer in the, in it. And that was back before there were serial killers in every TV show and everything else like that. Um, and the uh, so every reader in Hollywood was locked up. It was a hundred degrees in August or September and no one could open their windows for fear that this guy was going to climb in. So it got a lot of really good readings during that period of time. And, but it was sent out to a lot of really big directors at the time. And I'll never forget. Um, it was sent to Walter Hill who I worked with on another 48 hours and Walter read, he picked up the phone and he called my agent. He'd gotten to about page 59 and he said, I love the script. It's unbelievable. I want to do it. Blah, blah, blah. And then he never called back. And um, I always knew that I had uh, about 65 or 70 really good pages. And I knew I did not know how to end this thing. And one day, and the script had a, had kind of a life of its own for many years. In fact, I got a lot of jobs off of, off of Switchback. It was called Going West at the time. And, um, but uh, anyway, it, it would, it would pop up and an actor would get involved or somebody would read it and it, it, it had a kind of cult following that kind of pushed it along from place to place. And it eventually ended up in uh, Sherry Lansing's lap at, at Paramount. And she called up and she said, uh, would you like to direct this? Which you just don't get those kind of calls. 
And I'm sure she thought she could save a boatload of money uh, by having me come direct. It. And I, um, I, it was just the right time. And I, I thought that the transition would be easier. I'd worked with a lot of uh, really great directors, Norman Jewison. I'd worked with Spielberg on, on the Indy uh, and George Lucas and, 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 and all these guys. And so I thought, you know, how hard can it be? You know, somebody gets your coffee and the whole thing. Well, uh, what I, I, I love the, the part of directing, uh, the managerial part of directing. I thought that was fantastic. And I thought it was very, very good about that. And the, the, the actual part that is the alchemy of directing, finding that, you know, the, the, the inspirational, taking a piece of material and elevating that, um, I do not think I will ever have that piece. And so I have a tremendous amount of respect for directors who, um, who are just invested in that. Uh, it, it, that. That gets my undivided attention as a writer. So moving on with my career into, into show running, it's, you know, I don't ever try to direct the director, but I do know how to support that director and I do know how to push the hell out of them. So uh, that part of, I think, you know, I think that directing is a terrific place for writers because you get an understanding about the entire industry. And I'm talking about a, phenomenal group of craftspeople that you really need to know what everybody does because that makes your work better. What do you say to the writers who really don't want to direct? They just want to write. Um, I, I have to tell you, I thought I was going to be a director. I thought after Switchback, I was getting ready to, um, I was prepping my next film and um, my uh, my wife became very ill and I actually had to take uh, uh, a little more than four years out of the business just to, uh, uh, to, to sort of uh, to, to nurse her back. And, and she eventually passed away. But, but during that time where I was sort of in a, you know, a, a self-imposed hiatus, taking care of my children and, and, and that sort of thing, you know, directing just went out the window. You cannot direct. You can't, I couldn't leave the house. So um, uh, I, I had a, uh, a, a new love affair with writing. I mean, I, I found that um, uh, there's nothing, the, the idea of every Hollywood screenwriter needs to suddenly become Larry Kasdan, for example, uh, didn't, uh, it went right out the window with that idea. And I, and I, I found uh, that I would attack scripts differently and I attack stories differently and I listened a lot more I listened to studio, I listened to agents, I listened to actors, I listened where I didn't listen before. Um, but I think there is, I think writing is a spectacular profession. Screenwriting is like the coolest job in the world. And I think if, if you have no desire to direct, um, but you want to be a writer, you should be the very best writer you can possibly you can possibly be and learn about the business, but, but understand that that's, you know, there are a lot of fabulous writers out there who've never directed, never produced, uh, never done anything other than that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about The Fugitive. And uh, I want to move into that with this uh, comment from Jane Henning. She, uh, she writes, I attended a panel at AFF where you shared meeting Harrison Ford for the first time. It was a total disaster. Would love to hear that story again uh, and how he got the idea for The Fugitive on the plane ride out. So could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the birth of The Fugitive and this, wow. infamous, um, this infamous meeting with Harrison Ford? Yeah, I wish Jane had not remembered that because it's <laughs> embarrassing every time I, I, you know, I think about it. But uh, no, I didn't. I, um, uh, to take it one step beyond the AFF piece, I had been um, I'd been offered the fugitive uh, months and months before um, they actually signed me onto it. And Warner Brothers had, had had brought it to me, and I I pitched them I pitched them an idea about it, and they said no. And the idea basically said it's not a serial, it's a it's a it's a one shot movie. Uh, he and I said the reason is because if he if he if he killed his wife, uh, if he's accused of killing his wife, I want to solve that. I want to make that a thriller. I want to make that, uh, the whole story is about proving, not, not running away from the electric chair, but proving that he didn't kill his wife. And for some reason, Warner Brothers thought that was really sucked as an idea. 
And um, uh, anyway, finally one day they called up and they said, hey, you know that idea of making one movie and, uh, and, and solving this story, this crazy story about you know, the fact that you didn't kill your wife and all that kind of stuff. And also maybe the idea that the Gerard character isn't the antagonist, he's a, I used to describe this as having two investigative engines. One is this investigative engine between, you know, uh, Kimball and Gerard, and then the other one being Kimball and, and the, the one-armed man. Anyway, uh, that was way over their heads at the time. Um, but anyway, they said, you're hired. And it turns out that I was hired because Harrison Ford had said, hey, I got an idea. I would do this if we make only one movie. And I like the idea that maybe I would just be trying to solve a mystery about finding my wife. But I, they didn't share that with me. So I got on a plane and, and I, I live on the East Coast. I flew out to LA and when I landed, um, I thinking I was gonna go into a series of meetings with the studio for the next few weeks. Uh, I, th that wasn't the case. I was met at the gate and the, the, the driver, uh, this is back when you could still meet people at the gate. The driver said, um, uh, Warner Brothers wants to know what your, your tennis clothes size are and, and what kind of rackets you play with and what stringing tension you need for your rackets. And I thought, well, what? And I had been a tennis pro before I went back to graduate school. So, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I, I was, I was pretty good with the rackets and, and, uh, and apparently the word had gotten to Harrison that I was a good tennis player and he has a court that sits up at, you know, his ranch. And I didn't know that at the time, but what the, the punchline was, I, I'm going straight from LAX to Van Nuys Airport and getting on the Warner's jet and flying to Jackson Hole and pitching The Fugitive, which I had no idea what The Fugitive was. In fact, I probably had a couple of drinks on the plane from New York to LA, so I really should have been much more focused about this. Anyway, I, I literally land, I, I am driven across LA, I get to Van Nuys Airport, there's the jet, there are all the executives from the creative piece, there's the producer, Arnold Copelson, um, we didn't have a director, we didn't have anything. Uh, but what they were in was a horse race, uh, a horse race with Paramount for another Harrison project. And so we had literally 24 hours to go to Jackson, have Jeb pitch him my great idea, which I didn't have, for The Fugitive. And, uh, and we, hopefully we would win the horse race with Harrison to get him to do The Fugitive at Warner Bros. So I got on the plane and the first thing they did was they said, tell us what this story is. And I said, I haven't a clue. And then they said, go to the back of the plane and figure it out. And I went back there and I had fortunately read a Wall Street Journal article on the flight from New York about pharmaceutical fraud and thought I could work with that. And I had some vague ideas about stuff. And uh, next thing you know, we were in Jackson and we drive out to the ranch and we are shuttled right up to, to Harrison's house. And I go in and Harrison's there and, and we all say hello. And he sits down and he says, tell me the story of the future. And it was by far the worst pitch that God could imagine. I, I stumbled. I, I couldn't remember people's names. I, I was exhausted. It was just, it was a nightmare. And about 20 minutes in, Harrison said, time out. He said, this is crazy. You know, you get off the plane, you don't have any time. You know, did you bring your tennis clothes? And fortunately, Warner Brothers had thought long and hard about this. And sure enough, I had shorts and a shirt and two brand new rackets strung to perfection and i said sure so we went out to play and I, I thought this will at least buy me another hour to come up with a story and that sort of thing so i'm out there hitting with harrison harrison's at, at the time we were both a lot better than we probably are now but we were hitting back and forth and um and he finally he comes up to the net and he says hey this is great why don't we play a little bit so i said sure so we play he's he's serving first and next thing you know i'm down I'm down, you know, love 40, this guy, 40, love this guy. And I'm thinking he, you know, you know, I'm not gonna let him beat me, but I, and I fought back and I won the game. And as we sort of turned the sides, he, he trash talked me. And he basically said, God, if I want a lesson, I'll just bring my pro out or I'll hit on my ball machine. I thought you were supposed to be pretty good, you know? And I remember I suddenly thought, screw the fugitive. I, 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 what I, I couldn't believe I'd just gotten trash talked. I didn't care if it was Harrison or anything. So I walked back and I got the balls and and I'm thinking, I'm not thinking about Richard Kimball, I'm not thinking about Gerard. I'm thinking, I bet this guy 
has never seen an Australian twist serve at 7,000 feet altitude. And I bet I could get that ball to land and vibrate and jump over his head. And I'm going to try to do that. So I rear back and I hit this incredible serve. And sure enough, the ball comes in with the spin on it. It lands and it starts to go up and vibrate like this. It sort of jumps around before it jumps over his head. And he takes this big swing and he smashes the top of his nose. And I mean, he went down as if I had shot him with a gun and down on the court about the T, you know, the T of the court. And I run up to the net and climb over the net. And when he looks up, his shirt's bloody, his hands are bloody, his nose is just already, it, it was, it was unbelievable. And I thought I could see the, the, you know, the Hollywood reporter headline, Stuart never works another day in Hollywood. And I was thinking, Oh my God, I said, I said, Harrison, you got to go to the doctor. We got to get stitches in this. And he said, no, no, no. I'm just going to, I'm just going to pinch it like this and it'll be fine. Uh, and he had a workshop where they made furniture and stuff like that. So he went into the workshop and there were all these burly Rocky mountain carpenters in there working on table legs and stuff. And we walk into his workshop to get his first aid kit. And they're all like, God boss, what's happened to you? And he said, Oh, Jeb did this, you know, and I got a lot of nasty looks and we sat there and he kept putting on butterfly bandages and they just kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. And, and I'm thinking this is just not going to end well. And finally, and the whole time we, we began joking and talking and getting to know each other under this, all of this, this, this blood fest. And finally, after a while of putting gauze in and then putting the bandage over the top, it stopped. The bleeding stopped and his blood was like that. And I said, I think this is good. I said, I still think you need to go get some stitches. And he said, no, no, no. We could look down the, the creek and you could see all the Warner executives walking back to the house about an hour had passed. And they were coming back to hear the rest of the pitch. And Harrison had this devilish idea. And he, he said, hey, I got an idea. He said, let's go back in and finish the pitch. But whatever you do, don't say anything about this. And I said, what, what do you mean don't say anything about this? He said, don't say anything about the nose. And, and I guarantee you, nobody is going to ask me about the nose. And I said, I, I will, I'll take that bet. There's no effing way that they're not going to say something right off the bat. He said, trust me, okay, they're not going to do it. So we went in. He went around to the kitchen. I went inside. And all the executives come back and said, oh, my God, how is the tennis? Please tell me. Please tell me you know, you guys got along and everything was okay and it's cool and you're bonding and all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, we had some issues on the court and it didn't go really, really well. And, and they said, oh God, oh man, don't screw this up. I mean, this is, you're going to kill us. And from the kitchen, we hear Harrison say, hey, you know, I think we made some progress out there. Um, who wants some lemonade? And, and, uh, and everybody sat down. Of course, you, Harrison Ford asked you if you want lemonade, you obviously want lemonade. So everybody wanted lemonade. So he, he said, Jeb, start talking. Tell me the rest of the story. We pick it up where we were on the court. So I, I, I totally unprepared. I finished telling the story. You know, there's this pharmaceutical fraud and there's this doctor and he's involved and blah, blah, blah. And, and sure enough, it tracks to the one arm man. And it, and, and it was just as dreadful as it was in the morning. And, and next thing you know, Harrison comes around the corner with this tray of lemonade and he sits down and he is completely focused on my pitch. And nobody says a word for 20 minutes. And afterwards, Harrison says, I'm in. I'm, I'm 100%. This is great. We're going to make this. Who should we get to direct this? This would be great. We should, we should really start talking. Maybe we can fly this person in. We start talking while Jeb's here. We get it. The executives are like, oh, my God, we've beaten Paramount. We are going to make this movie. This is fantastic. Nobody says anything about the nose. Okay. And we get in the car, and he says, let's go get some lunch. So he leaves before anybody can ask and get change his clothes, and he comes back. We get in the Suburban. We head into Jackson to get some lunch, and as we're – Driving along, I'll never forget, uh, we pass Melissa Matheson, his, you know, his, you know, wife at the time and his children. And, and they roll down the window and the kids say, oh, my God, Dad, what happened to your nose? And, and he, he explains that we were, had an accident on the tennis court. And then he turns around to the executives and he said, now, see, those children care about me. Unlike you guys, they care about me. They know that this is an important part of what I am. Anyway, uh, and then he told everybody that I did it. So um, that became a refrain we did too. But that's the story um, of how I got to know Harrison. And, uh, and we, we had to write that script because we were running behind to the set. 
so I got to know Harrison even better because we were we were writing as we were making that show. Well, that is a great story and appropriate for such a famous action writer like yourself. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Carl Staples is asking, did you watch any specific episodes of The Fugitive when writing the film script? Never saw it. Never saw it. Uh, never, never saw it. it. Never watched really? it. It was, it was uh, believe it or not, it was before my time. Uh, I knew that I didn't want to tap into, uh, I didn't want to tap into the, um, the, the TV show. Now, just remember, this goes back to an earlier piece. I was like the 10th writer on The Fugitive. The Fugitive had been worked on by, you know, Robert Kamen and um, uh, Larry Gross and Walter Hill. And I mean, just a, a great group of every action writer in Hollywood, you know, uh, had done a pass, I guess, on it. And David Toohey, was the, or, excuse me, the original writer um, who I did not have any connection to. But what um, some of those stories had taken it to Mexico and everywhere. But the idea uh, was always, uh, all the other scripts had been, we're setting this guy on the run and it's just going to be, uh, we're going to run. There was never any, ever any, you know, come back and make an investigation out of it. So um, uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, that's that's pretty much how um, you know how how that part particular part of it worked. You know, I see that in a lot of scripts from new writers, where they think they're writing the fugitive, but they only have the character on the defense. He's not on the offense. Right. And I always have to remind them. You know, Dr. Richard Kimball was out to prove his innocence. He you know he had a very specific thing that he was running to while he was running away. Right. And uh, I think that's what the future does so, so beautifully. Um, and of course, it won uh, an Academy Award for Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, as a screenwriter, does that put a feather in your cap? Because we know that uh, actors are really important. And if they know that uh, a writer wrote an Oscar winning role, does it make perhaps getting talent attached a little bit easier? Um, I'd like to think that uh, actors would like to do scripts that I work on because I, I really love what they bring to the table. Um, in the fugitive case, I think if you ask Tommy, um, uh, I, think t I, I think in Tommy's acceptance speech, he, um, he thanked every, every grip, he, he even thanked craft services, but he never thanks, he never thanked the writer. Um, uh, and, uh, but part of that is that we fought tooth and nail throughout that entire process, but I don't, I don't find fighting, you know, with actors about roles and stuff like that to be a bad thing. I think you can, it's like family. You can, you know, you're making something you want to get, you want to hear what the other person's saying. You you can fight, you know, about it, but, it, but it, it, what happens is that there, uh, it, it, the ideas get distilled and, and the best stuff comes up. So in, in that situation, I think that was great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad he got it. I, I think that um, uh, if, if I'm honest, and, and nobody is, nobody is <laughs> signing on to do a Jeb script because Jeb Stewart script because uh, they think they're going to get an Oscar off of that role. Um, uh, but I do think that that's, uh, uh, I love working with really good actors and, and I really try hard to listen to what they're, what they're saying when we work on, on pieces. That was a tough year, too, because that was, I believe, it was the year of Schindler's List. And so you had a performance like Ray Fiennes, and John Malkovich also portrayed the bad guy in, um, in The Line of Fire. I believe right. he was also up that year. So it was some pretty stiff competition. Um, Ramesh, do we have any questions from the group uh, that are coming through live? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, someone wanted to know, do you, um, did you write projects on spec when you started out? Uh, yes, I did a few. Um, uh, I, I did a, a, a project called Fire Down Below, which was based on some experiences I had in Appalachia that uh, ended up being bought by Warner Brothers for Steven Seagal. I didn't, I didn't work on it once Steven had it, but I did that and uh, obviously switched back. Um, it's, 
the spec world for me, uh, I was very fortunate because, you know, coming in and having a good spec script is crucial. Uh, something like Switchback, to just it becomes a cult script that, you know, can be taken out as a, as a proof of, 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 of what you can do. And then my second project was, was Die Hard. So I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question to, but I think it's, you know, at this point of my career, and I advise people all the time, just continue to write. It's, it's crucial for writers to write, and it's crucial for writers to get good feedback. And I think spec material is going to be, uh, it's always your best, it's the best way to say, what have you done lately? Where's your head at right now? How, what are you looking at the difference between network writing and say uh, streaming writing, you know, what, you know, between features and, and television. So uh, I think spec work is crucial to get uh, for everybody at every phase of their, of their career. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between writing for features writing for TV, writing for streaming? Is there a difference between writing for streaming and writing for TV? Um, I, I started making it sort of, uh, to, to use this analogy, it's, it's, you have to retool. Uh, I had to retool. Uh, coming from the feature world, um, about 10 years ago, I, I began thinking about what this new universe would be like in terms of television and streaming and even, um, you know, premium cable, all of those type of things. The, the idea of, of um, developing a character over a longer throw than what you can do in a movie uh, required me to, to step back. Um, I didn't really, I think once, once we moved in the last five, six years into really just a heavy duty screen, uh, streaming uh, where you're not, you know, not moving on a, uh, an hour clock that has five, six, God forbid, seven commercial breaks in it, you can do so much more. You know, those type of shows uh, suddenly depend a lot on post-production to kind of, kind of fit, fit their peaks and you have to have a formula to kind of make that work. The great world that we, you know, we, we can live in now where you can stream an hour show without, or 45 minute, 55 minute, you know, even, you know, 65 minute show, without commercial breaks is just, uh, is just a dream. And to be able to build that character over a longer period is great, but it does require retooling. It, 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 does, it, it does make you think when, and what I always come to it is if, if I'm the person watching, I wanna be in the buyer's mode. I, how am I gonna be entertained? What's gonna push me to, to, you know, to keep watching that, that show? And that it has to come in from a lot of different ways and it has to come faster than the feature world. Uh, Grandma G wants to know, do you still fall in love with a blank page? More so than I did 30 years ago. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being real honest. Uh, I, I, used to, I used to hate the blank page. Uh, I was not a big outliner. Um, so I, I waited for the muse to, to you know, come to work, and, um, and sometimes she was tough. Um, now I've become um, a, a much uh, a bigger outliner because I find that I can get the muse to work anytime I want. I just need to be able to, to focus on it. And part of that, part of that metamorphosis for me happened when my, my wife was very ill and I, I was, you know, um, I was having to, to uh, I, I couldn't really sleep through the night. I'd have to be up every two hours to, to push medications and things IV. So, when you're working on a two hour blocks, you learn you're gonna to have to work on two hour blocks. You don't have the benefit of an eight hour day or a 10 hour day or writing whenever you wanna work. You have to write when you, when you get a chance to work. So um, uh, no, the, the blank page or the, uh, the, the, the blinking cursor doesn't scare me at all anymore. I, 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 I really love getting into it. And I think that's a, a great thing for most writers to, to, to just kind of embrace the demon that that thing is and, and go after it, but go after it with a plan. Do you subscribe to any particular uh, structure when you write? Do you use a three act structure, or eight act structure, five act structure? Do you I even think, think about it? Yeah. You I, you know, I, I think that one of the nice things about uh, streaming shows too is that you know we we've sort of been freed somewhat from a structure. Um, you know that um, uh, as an instructor of screenwriting, I've I've had the 
the great pleasure to see how really good dramatists uh, coming from the stage, uh, uh, especially at Northwestern where I taught, uh, we would see a lot of playwrights coming in and they were coming in without any of this react, you know, classic Hollywood structure and things like that. Um, uh, for me, and the type of writing is, is all about development of the character and, and, and the entertainment of your audience. And by entertainment, I don't mean that in, you know, um, uh, I, I, I don't mean it in the broad sense, but in entertainment in terms of we are providing an entertainment, whether it's a, whether it's a drama or, or, you know, that just, you never stop crying throughout that's fulfilling an entertainment purpose. So, um, I think it's really cool to come at things in a different way. But if you don't develop the character and you don't move the story along, it's the wrong format and you need to be open to other, other formats that can make that work. Ramesh, do we have any um, live questions coming in? I had one question. Uh, your films have a lot of terrific set pieces, uh, whether it's Die Hard, uh, The Fugitive. I, I actually watched Switchback this morning um, again and uh, just sort of what do you consider when you start writing a set piece and also how important is the geography uh, when you're writing an action sequence? And that's a really good question, Ramesh. I, uh, in Switchback, I, I, um, I remember there was, a, there was a scene we were trying to get uh, uh, a dentist to do where he slides down a hilltop as, an, as a train is coming to, is heading toward a tunnel and uh, he was on a, you know, he was on a decelerator and, um, and it had to stop with him hanging right, right above where he grabs onto the cliff. And, and, uh, it sounded like a great idea in my, in my office when we were on location and there is this, this million ton locomotive coming at 40 miles an hour. Um, uh, it, it looks totally different. We, we hunted for a lot of tunnels before we found the right one. And then, um, uh, fortunately, uh, Dennis was one of those kind of actors that said, hook me in. I'm, I'm ready to do it. He, I think he trusted everybody implicitly, which I would never do. And, um, but I, I think that those type of, those pieces are, are really crucial. Um, uh, they're fun for me because if you continue to look at every part of the set piece, whether it's jumping off the building and die hard, how can you continue to, to, to make it work? What, what have you got to work with? And, um, and, and it's the richness of a set piece that, that's appealing to me as an audience member. Uh, it's, not, it's not just bigger and, and louder. It, it, it has to have nuances to it. Heidi Stangeland wants to know, what, what is your process to get an idea and turn it into a concept? Um, I, I'm a big believer of things that go bump in the night. Um, and, and, and I've been bumped in the night so many times I have bruises. It's just, it, it, it there, there are things that just, uh, make me un, uh, uncomfortable. And I've had the, I've had the good fortune. I was working once in, in Kentucky when I was in college and, um, uh, and I had a, a situation where I had the opportunity to go into a coal mine at the time, and I thought this would be a great idea. I thought we'd walk into a cage and we'd be dropped in, and instead we got into a cart, you know, like a, a small cart, and it was one of those situations where we, we were going into the mine in a cart where I noticed all the miners leaning back, and if we didn't lean back, it would just decapitate you, and I had to lean back too with my hard hat on, and no one, I didn't know how long I would have to stay in that position, and it was terrifying, and I thought that, um, so you know, people ask me all the time, you know, uh, younger people ask me all the time, look, I've got this great opportunity to be a PA on a, on a film or a commercial or a show. Um, and I, and I know that they want to be a writer and I say, well, what's plan B? And they'll say, well, you know, I can go dig a ditch in Baltimore for the summer and work for city works. And I'm like, go dig a ditch. I mean, it's, it, you know, you're not going to get the, the thing that is the, the greatest situation for me as a writer is continually finding ways that life brings me new experiences um you know and and it just cataloging them you know being in a coal mine being on top of a, a, an elevator going up you know the um, um any time a lot of times i'm working on a movie and i um uh i was working on a project that never got made but it was 
uh, it was in Washington, D.C. And I thought of an idea. I thought, you know, I had heard about steam tunnels and I had this concept that I could get in a steam tunnel in Maryland and make my way all the way into the Capitol Dome. Uh, which, by the way, you can do, and well, not in Maryland, but you can get to the edge of the situation, and you can't do it now because everything's been, since 9-11, everything's been bolted down, but it's, um, uh, it, it's a, it, these are just experiences that you can draw upon, whether that they ever make that show or not, there's something about it that leads you to something else, and so I continually, I, I'm in that sort of aggregation of experiences place, and that's what you should always do. Uh, I was going to dismiss this question, but it keeps coming up from various members. So I'm going to read Dennis Coleman's incarnation of it. His favorite line in The Fugitive is when Harrison Ford, finally confronting Tommy Lee Jones, tells him he didn't kill his wife. And Jones' character says, I don't care. Dennis wants to know, where did that line come from? It seems like Tommy Lee Jones uh, has taken some credit for ad-libbing it. Is there any truth to that? Huh. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. It's that old situation about, um, it, you know, great lines of dialogue suddenly have a thousand fathers. But um, <laughs> I, I remember that piece extremely well because uh, we were shooting on a Westinghouse uh, in an old warehouse in Chicago and it was freezing cold and they had production design had created these tunnels. There was just a maze of tunnels all through this warehouse and they had pumped water through and at the end of the uh, at the end of the the choreographed piece, uh, there was a big opening where the water poured out, and they had a gigantic backdrop behind of, of the the dam in North Carolina where we had shot the the dam sequence, and um, and it was one of the few times that Harrison and and Tommy were working together. There's that, and then there's the very end of the movie, and then there's obviously the Hall of Justice scene where Harrison's coming down the stairs and Tommy's going up. And there's a chase that happens. Uh, th this is a perfect example of of, um, uh, of of the things I don't like about particular actors or stars or whatever you want to call it. But we're standing in freezing cold water, and uh, in the script it says I don't care. And the reason it says I don't care is because he's a U.S. marshal. He's not an FBI agent. Harrison Ford's character has uh, has been you know, arrested, he's been tried in a court of law, and he's been convicted. He has no rights, you know, the U.S. Marshals can just pull the trigger anytime they want on this guy. They don't have to read him his rights. They don't have to do anything. And I felt it was really, really important to get that point across to the audience. And so I don't care was the best way, but it, it, it's, it's an awkward line for an actor to say. And so we literally sat there, and I fed lines to Tommy for 40 minutes with Harrison, you know, God bless him as an actor. He, 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 he delivered his line. We didn't use anybody else. It was two actors working hard. And every time it was like, no, that doesn't sound good. No, that doesn't sound good. And we finally, after about 45 minutes of running these, these takes, uh, he said, give me something else. And I said, how about, I don't care. And he delivered it. They shot it. And they just, they printed that one. It was like, and he said, I don't know. I don't think that worked. And everybody laughed. And he said, that was the line in the script. So um, anyway, uh, Tommy can remember it any way he wants to remember it, but, but uh, uh, I've got the original script. So there's the truth, you heard it here. Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> Do you feel that writers don't always get the respect that they deserve? There's certainly that feeling amongst many writers because yeah of the fact that um, perhaps they come onto the process early, uh, they're forgotten about, they're rewritten. What's your take on that? God, we are a, a strange group of, of people and I totally get that. Um, uh, I, I think that you, the, the, the writers that I have uh, grown up with, the writers that I, um, um, identify with and stuff like that have sort of earned their place to be able to say, you know, screw you. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think the writer's job is to make sure is to make the mistakes on paper and in, in, in the real, in the business of making big features or making big shows and things like that for, 
or Netflix or Amazon or whatever is the responsibility to, to make those mistakes before you turn it over to somebody else. And I take a lot of pride in that because you don't want to send a $100 million production down a dead end and then have someone say, God, it seemed like a really good idea. It doesn't work. And that's the fastest way to be fired and bring somebody else in. So it's, that's, what, that's your job. And I enjoy that process of, of scoping the way through a neighborhood to get through the through street for the show. Um, but I, I, there is absolutely having been on the receiving end of no respect and, 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 and having, you know, the, the accolades that come with having, you know, successful shows. Um, I, I can't argue the point that writers don't get enough respect. Uh, they don't get respect like other people who are working their buns off. Um, I, uh, it may be that you um, we're sort of become fall into an intermediate category of, you know, you're, you're above the, the regular crew, but you're because you're in a creative situation, uh, but you're below that sort of top tier. Um, but uh, again, it's, uh, I try to give the writers that I work with, you know, tremendous amounts of respect, but I push them very hard to be the best writers that they can possibly be. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, 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 for better, or for worse, guys, I've, I've developed a, a reputation where I bite back and, you know, um, and I think that's part of my job. It's, you know, it's part of your job to say, I've done my, the, the lifting. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that, that what I've done can't be adapted. It just means that if you don't like it, you got to top it. And that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean go out and hire somebody else. It means you have to appreciate the storytelling, the, the, the dynamics of storytelling that I brought to the table. And, um, um, and you have to earn that. Uh, you, you just have to, you, you can't, you can't negotiate for, for respect. You kind of have to earn it. It's a hard lesson to learn, but it's a good lesson. Go ahead, Ramesh. Um, let, can we talk about notes? Uh, how do you handle uh, taking notes or giving notes even? And uh, what should new writers learn about uh, taking and giving notes? And also, is there a difference between getting like studio notes and now you, you know, getting notes from say Netflix? Um, I, yes, there's a, a lot of difference and boy, that's a great question. Um, I think that in my, uh, career, I, I should have listened to notes better. I think that I kind of approach note giving as the person giving the notes oftentimes, um, was a failed writer who, you know, had, it's, it's, it's easy to give a note. Uh, it's easy to be reactively creative, meaning where were you when the page was blank? Um, uh, but I, as what, and, and, and this is a bad thing, but I, I mentioned a lot of times I, I don't suffer fools gladly. So don't spend two hours at 11 to 12 o'clock at night doing the notes for a meeting the next day and expect me not to bite you back. If you can't remember my character's names or the, or the effort that I put into it. I think that's a fair thing to say. Uh, to executives and 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 uh, but you have to bring that to the table what I would like to do if I could go back to part of my career is to listen better uh, I think that I'm uh, a lot of times I uh, uh, in my early part of my career I didn't listen to the note behind the note and what I try to do now and I try to tell you know my writers and I try to tell my students and other people like that that I uh, that they come to me for this is that oftentimes they can't figure out the studio or the network can't figure out exactly what's not working for them, but something's not working for them. And what I'm in the business of is that that's my first audience and I need to get them on board so that we can keep going. So I'm listening now more and more to what's, what's bothering you. Now I'm not going to spend all day drawing that out, but clearly something's there. And it, I'm either going to draw you into a situation where you're going to realize, um, you're over your head with this note, or I'm going to hear exactly what you're doing. And sometimes I can, I can, I can use what that, the, the note is trying to tell me and it, it triggers something. If you remember the old thing I just said a minute ago, uh, a lot of times the studio is reactively creative. You know, they couldn't have come up with a good idea when the page is blank, but because you put something out there that gets them thinking, then I try to create a dialogue where, what if we did X? And I'm not going to just 
go fishing for the studio, but I'm going to try to take the, the, the note behind the note and then, and then to build on it. And if it excites me, that's a good, that's a good thing. I don't, I don't, you know, by the, by the way, if it's a great idea, I tell, I tell the studio all the time, it's no longer your idea. My name's on the script, but I, um, but you have to be open to that. And you have to understand that uh, it, the, the collaborative process starts originally with, you know, with the, um, I think I may have lost my sound. Okay, no, we can we hear go. you. Yeah, yeah you can. Okay. There we go. Yes. I see. Okay. Uh, do you build story from a character or from a world or from an incident when you start off? Um, wow. I, it, it, you know, I know this is going to sound like I just punted this question, but it depends on the project. It really does. Um, uh, I, I, sometimes, uh, you know, in Switchback, uh, Switchback came from a, a character. Um, when I was in college i um i uh, showed you how long ago it was i had to uh, hitchhike and i got I, one time it was raining and sleeting and everything i was in north carolina and and um a car pulls over and uh the the, the the guy opens the door and i he i was so thankful to get in i only had about 10 miles to go and the guy in there uh, had wallpaper the inside of his car with images of naked men and uh, i had to decide whether to stand out there um or to get in the car and, 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 and drive off with somebody who obviously had uh, uh, his, his mind was not where my mind was at that particular moment. And I thought, what if I did that? What, what, what if I had gotten in that car? And that becomes the, the genesis for switchback. It's like if Danny Glover pulls over and his car is filled with, you know, images of, of, of naked women, uh, do, do it, does it change anything for me? Do I, I still think this is a strange person. Um, and what happens if he turns out to be a good guy? Um, so that's one instance where you just take a, a, a little piece of something and where does this, this particular piece go? I think that's always better um, than saying, I, I, I don't really, uh, if you take Die Hard out of the mix, I, I don't really write in this high concept situation where we've got um, a, uh, an event and let's build all the characters around an event. Sydney Hoffner has a question. She's very curious about your doing rewrites. And so she is asking how many projects might you rewrite a year? Do you still find yourself doing page one rewrites? Are they small character revisions? Are you brought in to do anything specific on scripts or is it very varied? Uh, you know, since I've made the move to, you know, to sort of the television world, I don't do many rewrites anymore um when i was doing rewrites a lot uh it, it the, you know i've i've come in i i'm not the kind of guy believe it or not that that comes in to punch up the dialogue um I, when i was working on outbreak i came back to my trailer one day and uh carrie fisher was in my trailer and i said carrie what are you doing she said don't worry uh, I know you're working on the script and everything, and I'm working on the important parts of the story. I'm just brought in to punch up the dialogue, and I'd never, I'd never experienced any of that. So it was kind of fun to have her say, "What if we said, blah 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 blah?" And I'm like, "We don't have that character." And she said, "Yeah, but what if we had that character?" So it, that's a confusing universe that I've never been a part of. But uh, I've always asked the question of, "What am I doing when I come in on a project?" I, I I, I, and this is why I communicate with the original writer or the writer previous to me, which is where we, where did, were the people who were writing the checks have the issue with your story? And nine times out of 10, they'll say, uh, they could never get over this piece that I'm trying to pull off. And, and, and uh, so sometimes, sometimes you have to go back to the beginning and, and, and start over. And other times you just have to look at it analytically and, and, and say I'm only brought in. I was I was brought in to rewrite um, uh, Steve's Alien on. Uh, I wasn't rewriting Steve. Just to be clear, I was brought in on Clear and Present Danger to write the end of uh, of, of of that movie. The end of the movie, you know, his script sort of stopped about page 
90 and we didn't have an end of it. So that was very specific coming in and just, you know, cleaning up and writing the end of that particular piece was very, very specific. Diversity is a big issue now in Hollywood. Is as a creator and showrunner, uh, are you paying attention to this? What uh, are you doing, perhaps, to address these diversity issues? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, I um, uh, from the beginning of uh, of my career, I've I've I've, 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 I've th there's no right way to answer this because if I say you know I've always been a proponent of it, or I've tried in my scripts to be, you know, to, to, to have, um, you know, actors of color in major parts, not just, you know, small parts. Uh, you know, I did a, a, a project um, uh, called Just Cause with Sean Connery and Larry Fishburn plays, you know, one of the, one of the big roles in that. And the, the idea to write, you know, an African-American you know, lead in that position at that time when we were doing it was was not something that the studio wanted. I, the, my follow up script from um, from Die Hard was a project also with Larry Gordon called In the Night, and uh, it was about a couple in um, Hancock Park who have a robbery, and it's a, it's an art it's an art uh, uh, theft. And Morgan Freeman was was originally cast, and I can remember going into Fox with the cast. We we had Richard Gere and Morgan Freeman, and the, the head of the studio said, um, Richard Gere will never make a movie. Uh, this is pretty, pretty woman. We'll, he'll never make a movie again. And isn't Morgan Freeman black? He can't play an art thief. And, you know, so it's, 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 it, 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 we've come a long, long way, obviously. And I've been in this kind of pivotal piece in my career. But I, I look at roles much differently. I directed a, a small movie, an independent movie, about 10 years ago called Blood Done Sign My Name. And I had a large uh, uh, African-American cast, a big ensemble cast. And um, it, it, you know, even feeling like I had a very good control on it. First of all, I, I wrote this movie and it, was, and, it, and it brought in some terrific talent because of my script. I realize that I, I'm, I'm constantly, every generation brings in a constant flow of what, what diversity means. How does it, how do I, you know, what does the black and white issue mean in terms of, you know, being a filmmaker and, and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and I'm still to this day looking at every project from that, that aspect. When I teach, my cat, my classes are very diverse and, and, uh, and I stumble through it. I'm look, I'm a, I'm a white guy in his 60s, and I, you know, uh, I grew up in the South. I've got a name like Jeb Stewart, but it doesn't mean that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm closed into into one way of thinking. And I think that that's that's great for Hollywood, but it's only great when writers are proactive about their approach to diversity. Even if you make a mistake, even if you're a white guy and you make a mistake, it's ten times better to be doing this because if you bring great talent by your writing in, it will only push, it'll only push the envelope to a better place. So I, I, I try every day to do that. Rick Kalesa wants to know, were you asked to contribute to any of the Die Hard sequels? Um, uh, the, the long and short of that is I was working on another 48 hours too when they did, um, Doug Richardson's, uh, they, they adapted Doug's script 50, uh, I think it was 59 minutes or something like that, which is a really great action piece. And they made that die hard too. And, uh, and I remember being brought in on a couple of times to say, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? But it was not even an advisory situation. And, um, Nothing on three, and by after three, there was you know it was a totally different universe as far as uh, as far as I'm concerned. Ramesh, um, someone want to know what was the what best advice could you give to your past screenwriter self? <laughs> <laughs> um, be uh, be kinder on executives, um, believe it or not, and. Um, uh, I think that I, uh, uh, 
I, I really think I would have, uh, I got to a place where I uh, burned out a little bit as a writer. And, uh, and, and by burned out, I just mean, I don't mean that I, I, um, I got tired. I, I didn't appreciate the joy that writing brings me. It was a profession. I was good at it. I loved doing it. I loved working with all the people. I didn't want to be doing something else, but um, I, I lost a little bit of the, 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 the joy of the creativity. And at this stage of my career, I don't, I don't come to work anymore uh, with anything but a, um, uh, a, a joy about creating something. It's just a really great thing, uh, and I don't take it for granted at all. It really is wonderful. Maria uh, has a question about your directing. Uh, she just wants to know, do you have any strategies to bring out the best, most relaxed and natural performances from your actors? How do you work with actors? Um, uh, I, I deal with actors, you know, um, uh, I think, I, first of all, it, that goes back to casting. And if you're a part of the casting process, you know, you, you really spend an enormous amount of time listening to actors, giving them, uh, you know, to, uh, mixing it up just a little bit so that you can hear a, a take from different angles. And I, I think the, the, the actors that I'm drawn to in auditions and I'm, I'm drawn to, I, I enjoy working with, and I'm, I'm working with a really wonderful young cast right now on Valhalla, it's 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 what can you uh how can you elevate what i write how how are you excited about uh, about taking that particular character into a different place and so that's where um from a directing standpoint and from that uh, i um uh, maybe i'm not answering the question right but i think that that's um um uh, that's what I, that's what excites me about an actor when i bring them in Will you direct again? Um, oh, I, I would love to direct again. I think it depends upon the project. Um, I, I, I've kind of, I'm, I'm very happy in the position that I'm in now. Um, there, there used to be a, an old story in North Carolina about the man who would um, um, go out and, and in the old days would, would drive up to the, you know, the house and, and, and tell the, the next the person who this group in North Carolina had decided would be the next governor of North Carolina. In those days, North Carolina was always a, a, a democratic state. And the, the, the great story is that the, 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 the person drives up to the house and says, you know, uh, you know, gosh, Chris, you know, I'm here to tell you, we decided you'd be the next great governor of North Carolina. And that person turned and said, well, you know, damn it, Jeff, why would I, why would I do something, something stupid? I'm already the guy that tells the governor of North Carolina what to do. So um, I think that I, I'm very happy with where I am right now, not that I get to tell the directors what to do, but I do think that uh, I, I like working in a, in, a, in a place where somebody who's directing something that I've written is better than me at directing. And I can, I, I'm, I'm there to support them doing what they, what they love to do. I mean, they, you know, the directors that I've had the great fortune to work with, they love what they do and they, they elevate and I can't, I probably will never be that. So uh, if I don't direct again, that's okay. But um, uh, if, if it's the right project, I would. Can you Stephen, talk a little, oh, 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 no, ahead. please, R Ramesh, uh, can, please take the floor. Can you talk a little bit about the Liberator, how the project came to you and how it was, you know, writing it and uh, considering it's animation and live action, right? If I'm right about that. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the Liberator came to me, it was a book, uh, obviously, and, um, uh, it, and it involves the, the, the World War II story of Felix Sparks, who was a very young second lieutenant uh, from the American Southwest. And he is, he begins World War II as a sort of a back office second lieutenant who talks his way into getting um, uh, in charge of a, a rifle company of, of seven or eight uh, Native Americans and Mexican Americans from, from the Southwest. And he, he's in combat with this group for 500 days. And at the end of 500 days, he's advanced all the way to being a, a colonel in charge of 10,000 troops. 
And one of the things that I thought was just fascinating about the, the story, this goes back to your, the diversity question before, was uh, I'm, uh, I'm a big believer that, that, that if, you can get, if you can get stories with great diverse characters, you know, especially Native American characters who are, who are incredibly underserved in, you know, in the media, it's, 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 it's a great, it, it, it can be a great opportunity. So that was the, the, the joy for me to work on this particular project. And um, uh, it, it started as a live action piece. And we went over to um, uh, Romania and Croatia and began looking at, at uh, where can we do it for a budget and how can we make a big World War II piece. And I'll be darned, there aren't any tanks anymore in Europe and there are no B-17s in Europe. And how are we going to do this without spending an enormous amount of money on visual effects? And eventually it was the budget that killed the Liberator. And about a year or so later, um, uh, it was, the project was at A&E and uh, in walks uh, Chad Crowley and his group from Atlanta who do a project. Uh, they have a proprietary type of rotoscope mm -hmm. called Trioscope. And they said, We're, it's, it's an animated project. And I thought, I, I, there's no way you can tell a, a, a dramatic piece like Liberator in this format. And they showed me uh, what it's like, how, how Trioscope worked. And I was immediately sucked into these characters. I just, I, I, it was as if um, it was, it, it was a, almost a graphic novel approach, except I'm looking at a live action, uh, an actor doing live action. And, um, and I didn't think about anything about the format after that. And I was, uh, I was uh, an acolyte from that moment on. It, it, it's, it's a great way to shoot. And I think the Liberator benefits from it. It opens it up to a whole different audience than it would have had before. And um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, that. Sometimes y you think it going down a path is, is the only way to do something and something else comes at you and it, it changes, it changes every, everything that you think about storytelling. And that's going to premiere this year on Netflix? Probably. Uh, I, you know, again, um, I, uh, I, I, I'm just the, the lowly, you know, writer creator. I don't know when Netflix drops it, but we've been talking about November and we're really hoping around Veterans Day is a great time to do this. And, and uh, it would be a terrific time for it to come out. That's, that's the time that they're thinking about. Did you have to change a lot of your writing when you switched over to uh, because it was going to be animated form or? No, I, in fact, uh, Ramesh, I was able to add things back into it because I, now I could afford to do stuff. Um, you know, we didn't have a tank, but we can, um, uh, Greg and who who is the director, you know, is a spectacular, um, not only a spectacular director, but a really terrific visual effects artist. Uh, he did the bear in The Revenant, and he's done the Tie Fighters, and you know worked for for Lucasfilm for years. So it it, it allowed me the, the 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 benefit of saying in this situation we need this particular type of um, uh, of weapon, and and we can create that. We can we can we can work around it. And the actors the actors had absolutely no problem working off of a not just a green screen or blue screen, but everything blue, everything uh, except for their uniforms and, and the assets that are around them, like the guns and things like that. So um, I was able to do more in Trioscope than I could have done live action. So as we bring this to a close, Jeb, you have uh, uh, a large group of mostly uh, aspiring screenwriters. So let loose. What do you have to say? What, what advice, tales from the crypt? Uh, what is it that the great Jeb Stewart can share with, uh, with us here? God, I, I you know, um, I, I, I hate to offer any type of advice because it's just going to sound like there's so many better people out there who have really great one-liners. You know, I would like to come up with a yippee ki -yay type of thing that sums up my writing in, or, or advice. But, but, but the, the truth of the matter is, I, I think it's all about entertaining yourself as a writer. Um, you've put the 10,000 hours into storytelling. You have, uh, if, you're, if you're at all interested in writing, you're probably a, you know, a, a, a voracious reader. Uh, a voracious viewer and consumer of, of you know, dramatic visual media. Uh, there's, you know, 
I would trust that. I mean, the, the one thing that I tell my students is um, if you're bored, I guarantee your audience is going to be bored. Don't shortcut it. And also trust the muse when the muse comes to play. If, if you're in a scene and suddenly you get that, that the hair stands up on the back of your neck or you, you know, you, you just felt magic go through. Don't second guess magic. It's, 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 it's too rare. It's too wonderful. <laughs> Excuse me. So I, I think that, that that having fun with what you're writing is the number one thing. And if you've never written an action movie, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to write an action movie. You shouldn't apologize for writing action. You should you should tap into what it is that you would be entertained if you were a consumer in that area. Uh, and don't lie to yourself. If you lie to yourself, it's it's just going to come right out in your writing. Meaning, you know, if you say, well, they'll make it better. Uh, or they'll fix it in post. That's just the, the end of the road. It has to excite. And it first has to excite you as a writer. And as you said earlier, it has to be the very, very best that you can do. Uh, can I ask, yes. what excites you still as a writer? Um, I, you know, I came from a suspense world, Ramesh. I, I you know, I, I remember the, the, the joy of sitting down with Ernie Lehman uh, at Stanford and being able to um, have him talk about how Hitchcock's mind would kind of go. And I, I just thought, you know, that was, that was really neat. So if I come up, I love, I love suspense and I love a thriller. And I, uh, you know, um, what I am try to do with my pieces now is... I've always tried to build my script sort of like a Swiss watch um, that may be a little ambitious, but, but the idea is that all the pieces fit together. And so you can't pull one piece out and expect it to just continue to run smoothly. So as a, as a craftsman, one of the things that I love to do is I love to, to build something so that when you sit down and you start reading it, suddenly it's over and you're like, wow, I, 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 every piece fit together. It just ran like clockwork and the characters popped up at the right times and, and the characters interacted in the right time. And that takes just lots and lots of, of work. And, and, and I get caught up in the craftsmanship of that. So that's what I'm always looking for in a story. Does it have enough depth? Um, you know, I've got a lot of stories in my head, but they'll never see the light of day because they're a scene. They're not, they, they, they just won't interest me for, um, you know, for an episode or for a, for a feature. Well, you certainly entertained us, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> not just in your films, but here today, the feedback is, uh, is really good. So uh, if this were Rotten Tomatoes, it looks like you'd be at 100%. Uh, I, uh, you, I, I, I give your audience a lot more credit than that. So, um, but anyway, the, uh, I, I love what I do, guys. It's a great, you know, for everybody who's out there, it really is a wonderful, wonderful thing and it and it and it's an open door for anybody to get into this business if you if you can outwork the guy sitting next to you you've got a better chance it's it's really up to the effort you bring to the craft um i think every there's so many creative people out there a lot more creative than me but um you know thinking about how how pieces are put together and what excites you in the storytelling that's that's really the cool thing about what we do